And we have four uh, outstanding uh, speakers on the panel. We have uh, two law professors, uh, Michael Paulson and Helen Irving. We have a political scientist from uh, Keith Whittington from Princeton, and we have a historian, uh, Saul Cornell. So this is the interdisciplinary uh, panel. This is also the international panel because we have uh, a special welcome to <laughs> Helen Irving from uh, University of Sydney. Uh, in and the, I'm from uh, Brooklyn originally. <laughs> well, yeah. it's it's also much, another country. And those are talking international. I, I, I wasn't planning to point that out, but uh, uh, you, now that you've uh, let people know, we won't be able to keep that a secret anymore. <laughs> Uh, the order in which they're going to uh, be presenting uh, is that Keith Whittington is going to begin, and then uh, followed by uh, Saul Cornell, uh, Michael Paulson, and then uh, Helen Irving. Aha, uh -huh. so I was planning on sleeping through the first uh, few minutes oh, before, you I, before I had you to go. You didn't pay attention to my email. I, I, that's, I don't pay attention to any email. <laughs> um, okay, so um, uh, I was asked to... Uh, uh, to what? Uh, to uh, uh, talk some about um, uh, why originalism and the normative um, arguments uh, potentially uh, in in favor of originalism. And so um, uh, I have to admit I wear sort of multiple hats or maybe different masks um, uh, depending on what I'm doing as I think about things. So as I work more as an empirical um, political scientist, my view about um, how judges behave is probably a little closer uh, to Lawrence Friedman's uh, way of thinking about um, the relationship between uh, law and um, and what judges do and and uh, society and politics uh, more more generally. Um, here in talking thinking about originalism, I'm wearing more of a political theorist um, hat um, rather than an empirical political scientist. So I'm not necessarily very confident that judges. Um, are likely to be influenced by originalist arguments or behave in particularly originalist ways, but I think it's an interesting theory. Um, so, and it has um, uh, interesting features that connect it to uh, democratic theory and, and other ways of thinking about um, interpretation of text uh, generally. So, um, in thinking about normative arguments uh, for originalism, um, I generally approach this in trying to think about uh, internal arguments and external arguments, um, and I think of them as, as working uh, together. Um, the internal argument um, uh, is, and they're both sort of potentially um, controversial, of course, but the internal argument I take as a starting point, thinking that there's some common ground about what it is we think judges um, are supposed to be doing, what it is that we take them um, to be doing that helps legitimate the activity um, of judicial review. And so if we can unpack uh, to some degree um, what it is they uh, claim they were, they're doing or what it is we say um, that they're doing, um, uh, where does that um, uh, lead us? And I think it leads us to um, originalism. And then an external argument about why we ought to care about uh, these kinds of things at all, in which you have to start more from political fundamentals uh, in order to um, uh, get there. So briefly, the, the uh, internal argument, I think, really starts with something like um, uh, the kind of claim that uh, Chief Justice John Marshall makes uh, in, in Marbury, um, that the judicial role is saying what the law um, is, and presumably we could read that um, in um, uh, what would have been suggested um, uh, in the last panel in sort of a modernist way in which if judges um, are saying what the law is, really what we think of is the judges are legislating uh, for us. They're telling us what the law is now going um, to be um, through uh, pronouncing it. Um, but generally speaking, I don't think that's what uh, gives the court much legitimacy, at least in the realm of judicial review. We may find that a more plausible account and a more uh, reasonable and attractive account uh, in some other context, if we're talking about tort law or contract law or something. But I think in the context of constitutional law, where judges are claiming to be able to trump uh, legislative decisions, I think it's very hard um, to read um, uh, that kind of claim in, in that kind of way. Instead, uh, what we often say is um, uh, that when judges are saying what the law is, they're simply clarifying and elaborating and articulating uh, what the law is already taken uh, to um, be. That is, they're interpreting um, a pre-existing uh, law and that what um, justifies the practice of judicial review of setting aside um, legislative decisions uh, is the claim that judges are faithfully and correctly interpreting um, a superior law and applying it uh, to the particular um, cases uh, before them, which then um, raises the question, well, what does it mean to try to uh, interpret um, uh, the law, uh, at least interpret the law in a way that might um, help um, justify a practice uh, like um, judicial review? Uh, 
And here there's an assumption that the text of the Constitution has legal authority that if we correctly interpret um, this particular text, um, it has uh, particular kinds of legal consequences, uh, most notably uh, legal consequences that it would um, overcome the inferior law um, passed in uh, statutes by um, uh, legislatures. Um, so take that as a given for the moment, that we take the text of the Constitution as being um, uh, authoritative and superior for this purpose. What does it mean to try to interpret uh, the Constitution for this kind of purpose? And I think the, the argument then that leads to a kind of originalism is to emphasize uh, that what the text of the Constitution is, um, is communicative content that is trying to convey to us um, a communication uh, conveying a set of rules um, from uh, authoritative lawmakers um, to uh, those who are charged with interpreting uh, and applying law. And then the question is, well, how do we understand um, communications and, and try to interpret a communication um, that uh, has been uh, made, and in this case made in a way that's, that's um, particularly authoritative? Uh, and the answer is that a faithful interpreter um, requires necessarily trying to understand the content um, of that message. Now, the details of what the method might be of trying to uh, correctly identify um, what it is that the content of the message that's being conveyed uh, through law might be is, of course, up for grabs. And I think there are disagreements within the originalist camp as well as across um, originalist and non-originalist uh, about that. But I think the, the place that gets us at least uh, to an originalist uh, argument from a relatively common starting point um, is this claim that what judges are trying to do uh, fundamentally is trying to uh, interpret and understand and apply and elaborate um, a message that was communicated, a set of rules that were uh, communicated in, a, in an authoritative um, text. I think, though, that takes us to the external argument, which in general I find um, to be uh, more interesting. Um, and that is the external argument is why do we care? Um, about the content of this uh, particular communication. Why should we take uh, that to be the law uh, that needs to be interpreted and applied um, uh, by um, judges uh, particularly? Um, one way of doing that is to, again, recur back to the kind of um, arguments that Marshall wants to make, and even the text of the Constitution itself um, suggests that it is this Constitution um, that is um, uh, the supreme law of the land. But the question really is why um, are the particular messages that are being conveyed through the text of the Constitution, um, uh, whether we take that as being the text of the Constitution, so actual real live uh, text per se, um, or uh, things that we're trying to tease out um, of that text, perhaps through original methods, perhaps uh, through other methods. Why should we take any of that as being particularly authoritative such that it could trump um, uh, legislative uh, decisions in the, in the here and now? Um, and I think that the, the key move that has to be made is that it depends on an authoritative lawgiver, right? That we regard um, those who, ha who drafted the constitutional text that we're now trying to interpret uh, and apply as, as being particularly well positioned, that they alone had authority uh, to make a fundamental law uh, and a law and that's going to trump, trump subsequent lawgivers that um, operate with uh, less uh, general authority. So the founders and read broadly what the founders are in this context. And of course, uh, you can try to tease out uh, what exactly we mean by founders, who exactly were those lawgivers uh, that had that kind of authority. But here I'll just say broadly founders, that they were authorized to make law that's superior to law uh, being made um, by legislatures. And the task of the judge then uh, is to um, uh, correctly identify what that superior law is and enforce it um, uh, against, uh, against those legislatures. Um, so why should we take that seriously, right? So why are those uh, prior lawgivers, um, the founders, particularly authoritative in this kind of way? And I think that that has to rest on an appeal uh, to certain kinds of democratic credentials um, that um, uh, the founders had. Um, now this, of course, is complicated because when we talk about the founders, we're often specifically thinking about the founders of 1787 and their democratic credentials in a modern context seem a little uh, troubling, um, not exactly the same as what uh, we would want to embrace um, today. And I think, of course, that's entirely true. So, But generally speaking, when I think about this is from a broader theoretical perspective, is why should we interpret and apply constitutional rules drafted by one set of actors and apply them against another set of actors? Um, that, I think, is not necessarily specifically grounded uh, in uh, the details of uh, electoral mechanisms um, of the 1780s, but rather trying to think about what authorizes one set of lawgivers to trump um, other set of lawgivers. And, and the argument, uh, I think, ultimately turns um, on the kinds of democratic credentials that we think is possessed 
um, by the more uh, authoritative um, lawgivers. Now that's not obvious, not only from this perspective of thinking about very old documents like the Constitution uh, that we happen to have for the United States, uh, but even thinking uh, more generally, why should we take the credentials of one set of lawgivers as being superior um, to a different set of lawgivers? So Noah Webster, for example, um, uh, early in the nation's um, history, um, questioned whether or not there was an important difference between a, a popular assembly that we call a legislature and a popular assembly that we call a constitutional convention. At the end of the day, we're electing a bunch of representatives, they're making laws, um, and, and that's true for both legislatures and conventions. So as a consequence, there's no particular significance about whether we call those assemblies legislatures or conventions. And we shouldn't then think that, that one that's prior in time ought to necessarily then uh, trump the kinds of decisions that are being made um, by uh, one uh, later in time. Um, so I think there's an interesting challenge then, of, and, and we see sort of echoes of these kinds of arguments as well in, in appearing in people like um, Jeremy Waldron's concern that we ought to abandon judicial review uh, entirely, and why should we abandon judicial review? Because it, we shouldn't entrench um, constitutional rules and regard them as particularly authoritative against later democratic decision makers, right? So from his perspective as well, he would argue uh, that fundamentally there's no difference between a, what we would call a constitutional convention uh, and what we would call um, a, a later uh, legislature, uh, except the later legislature is later in time and therefore, generally speaking, we ought to take it um, as more authoritative rather than less um, authoritative than the, than the earlier um, convention. Now here I would occur in part simply to our normal thinking. While it is true that uh, from a matter of first principles, there are interesting questions about why we ought to take constitutional conventions um, as particularly authoritative, at least within this political culture and this particular legal system, uh, we do recognize that there's a distinction between conventions and legislatures, and we recognize that uh, within a legal hierarchy, um, these things that we call conventions are publicly understood to have greater authority uh, than these things that we call legislatures, just like we think uh, that certain kinds of administrative agencies have lesser authority uh, than legislative bodies as well, and we could do it differently, and maybe there's good reasons to do it differently, uh, but at least within this particular political system, when we have certain kinds of elections um, to create certain kinds of institutions, um, this is the particular hierarchy we've laid out. Somebody has to make decisions, uh, and in this case, uh, we the somebodies that get to make the decisions are the ones uh, that exist within constitutional conventions or similar kinds of mechanisms that are making constitutional rules like uh, the Article 5 uh, process uh, and, and the like. We might think, though, that conventions represent a particularly special deliberative process. So the reason why um, conventions ought to have particular authority or constitution makers ought to have particular authority relative to leg later legislators uh, is that they're more thoughtful uh, than later uh, legislators um, are. Um, and I think there's actually something to be said to this kind of argument. I don't know if I'd push it too far in thinking that um, uh, constitutional conventions are generally more deliberative or constitutional decision makers are generally more deliberative uh, than legislatures uh, in general, uh, but they are engaged in a very specialized and particular kind of uh, deliberative process um, that, that separates uh, the kinds of decisions that they're making there out. They're precisely concerned with making uh, decisions about rules that are going to have uh, long standing that they understand are going to be relatively uh, entrenched or going to apply uh, into the unknown future. Uh, and that encourages a certain kind of deliberation that's somewhat different uh, than what we get uh, in legislatures uh, more generally um, that applies in certain contexts. I know this may allow us to prefer um, a, a convention uh, making uh, decision making or constitutional uh, decision making specifically than simply um, uh, whatever decisions later legislatures uh, might want to um, reach. I also think there's something to be said for the idea of constitutional conventions um, as having a special kind of electoral authority. So we might think that they're more uh, deliberative than legislatures. They think more carefully. We also might think their democratic credentials um, are differently situated uh, than is true for legislatures uh, more generally. Um, and the particular value I think that I want to point to here of um, uh, something like a constitutional decision maker, especially in the context um, of a constitutional convention, um, is that they are temporary and separated from the general political process. So we look historically at um, constitutional conventions in the United States, they often involve a lot of the same political actors, uh, but not entirely. So it's not like the legislature just gets elected uh, to occupy 
uh, the rooms of the constitutional convention, it's all the same players. Instead, if we look at state constitutional conventions, and there's a lot more of those uh, than there are federal constitutional conventions to look at, uh, we often do see state legislatures getting themselves elected um, to constitutional constitution conventions, but we also see lots of state judges getting themselves elected to that. We see uh, former uh, political officials and lower uh, level political officials uh, getting themselves elected. We see people who otherwise were not holding elective office uh, getting themselves elected, and we see federal officials uh, getting themselves uh, elected to these uh, kinds of institutions. So um, it is the case that you're uh, that you're getting a slightly different set of representatives in order to make um, these kinds of decisions, precisely because they recognize um, that these are different and more important kinds of decisions than might be made uh, through the regular um, legislative process. And we might expect then that that's going to play out somewhat different uh, than what a normal legislature uh, might do. But also it's true that a constitutional convention has a very temporary standing, so it's physically uh, and temporally separated from uh, the normal log rolling that's going to occur uh, within the legislature, but it's also true that a constitutional convention is not going to govern, um, uh, hopefully, um, uh, with that same uh, kinds of documents. So in that sense, it's, it's somewhat like a jury, that it's called together for a very specialized a particular purpose, and then it disbands. And while some of its members may then go to try to operate a government under that constitution they were proposing um, beforehand, um, there is a separation in time and a separation in practice um, but between the two kinds of institutions that allows um, the constitution-making institution to step back a little bit uh, from the kinds of rules uh, that they want to uh, interpret and, and apply. Um, uh, uh, later, which I think is uh, an attractive feature of constitution making uh, broadly that we want to try to maintain. And, if, and one way of trying to maintain the features um, of that uh, constitution making process um, is by uh, emphasizing uh, the extent to which we're going to interpret and apply the rules that are adopted out of those systems uh, rather than uh, try to subvert them or replace them uh, with rules uh, uh, chosen out of a, a different system. Finally, let me note one uh, other aspect of at least the American constitutional process um, as it's um, developed over time, not instantly, um, but again, we felt our way toward a process that I think has uh, some values, and that's the virtue of the ratification uh, process as an additional step um, for elevating um, constitutional rules above um, other kinds of features um, of, of legislatures. And part of the attraction of a ratification process, laying aside the details of what exactly the ratification process uh, looks like, and there's lots of ways of designing uh, uh, ones, and, and the state constitutions tend to use, state systems tend to use a somewhat different one uh, than, uh, of course, the Article V process uh, that we're uh, more familiar with from the, from the U.S. Constitution. But the general reason why we have ratification processes in the first place is precisely because we distrust politicians. We distrust the people who are initially drafting up um, these constitutional provisions, and we want some other mechanism to hold them accountable and ensure that we uh, like the kinds of rules that we adopt. And I think that's an important check that's built into the constitution-making process that's less true um, of um, other kinds of political processes uh, that we are generally familiar with, whether it's the way judges interpret um, constitutions and make constitutional law, or it's the way legislatures uh, make um, uh, statutes down the road. Um, but th there's a, a, an effort uh, to think through, articulate, justify, and explain um, exactly what um, uh, constitution makers um, have tried to do, what exactly those rules are um, that they've established, and then have an entirely different set of institutional and political actors, maybe popular majorities through elections, uh, maybe something like state legislatures through the Article V process, but an entirely different set of political actors then evaluate that work uh, and either endorse it um, or, or not. Um, now, one thing we might think of as being attractive about that is the kind of thing that Mike Rappaport emphasizes is, is how uh, high the hurdles are um, of getting over that, right? That's a super majoritarian process, and maybe that's um, particularly attractive. And, and I'll just bracket at that point um, here, and, and Mike can defend it himself if he wants. But the, the, the point I want to make about ratification processes um, that I think is also um, attractive about them is not simply that they are difficult to get through um, and that they are super majoritarian in that sense, um, but they are separate from the process of drafting that you have to go to somebody else uh, and get their approval for the work that you've done before um, uh, the, the constitutional rules um, actually uh, go into effect. So there's something very particular about the ways in which we tend to draft um, uh, constitutional rules when we do it outside the normal political process. 
If we collapse those things and instead we just say, well, look, judges through the interpretive process um, can draft up constitutional rules. Um, two, we'll just call those uh, that constitutional law and constitutional doctrine, uh, and that's uh, just the same, or we have statutes that legislatures um, adopt and we'll just defer to those, and that's just as good um, as the constitutional rules that might be drafted up uh, through this higher lawmaking process. I think we lose something uh, important. Um, uh, by um, collapsing the constitutional process down to what is uh, fundamentally uh, the much more normalized um, uh, political process generally of, of uh, lawmaking that we're uh, familiar with uh, in general. And one attraction that I find in originalism is it's a way of re-emphasizing uh, that initial process of constitution making as separate from the normal legislative process um, that it, it, it uh, emphasizes the idea um, that uh, constitutional rules are not drafted by judges and legislatures. Um, the judges and legislatures are charged with interpreting uh, constitutional rules that come from somewhere um, else. And if you want to change those constitutional rules, there's a process for doing it. And again, it's a process um, that appeals to these kinds of specialized institutions rather than going through uh, somewhere else. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sure many of you are familiar with Lord Acton's uh, famous adage that power corrupts all and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> um, and I'm hoping this works because the alternative is an interpretive dance, which I'm not sure the crowd is quite ready for. Uh, some of you may be aware that we recently hosted a symposium at Fordham on the new originalism. Uh, this is the symposium, actually, not the whole issue. This is just the symposium part. Uh, we actually told people to write a haiku on originalism, but as you can see, they weren't able to stay within that boundary. So it's about 500 pages. Uh, one of the interesting things, uh, I think, that comes out of this, and, and pulling together this symposium, we invited uh, both representatives of new originalism, old originalism, in between originalism. There are actually now as many flavors of originalism as there are Ben and Jerry flavors. Uh, and actually, perhaps over dinner, we can come up with some new originalism flavors, you know, like semantic meaning swirl or something appropriate <laughs> like that. Um, but in any event, we invited philosophers, historians, uh, originalists of all uh, shape and size, uh, and temperament, and uh, uh, we produced, I think, a very, very good symposium. This Keith has an excellent article, Bernie Myler has an excellent article, and what's interesting about it is uh, the critiques of public meaning originalism, which come from very, very different camps, and I actually think that based on the critiques, public meaning originalism is a sort of in paradigm crisis. It, it clearly uh, is having some serious problems. So the first critique, uh, is, of course, comes from traditional originalism and is best represented by Larry Alexander's essay, and it essentially argues that uh, new originalism, as defined as public meaning originalism, because one of the other essays talks about new originalisms, as opposed to new originalism, so now we're getting into that. But essentially, public meaning originalism is entirely parasitic on traditional originalist, intentionalist theories. You can't really talk about meaning without intent, and therefore public meaning originalism rests on a pretty serious philosophical mistake. Uh, we actually invited two leading philosophers of language who also although they were very polite about it, pretty much argued that you can't really talk about meaning without intent. Uh, and if you were pulling together a theory of meaning, you would likely not build it around semantics, you would build it around pragmatics. Uh, uh, there is a sort of, you know, in classic paradigm crisis mode, an effort to build more epicycles into the theory. So you see a lot of Larry Solomon's essay trying to build in pragmatic features into what is essentially a semantic theory, I think not very successfully. And then, of course, there, uh, my article is a traditional intellectual history critique of uh, orig public meaning originalism, which both builds on the philosophy and established uh, historical methodologies. Uh, and so I think pretty much public meaning originalism is dead in the mortar as a philosophical matter, although politically, like vampire movies in the 60s, where after killing Dracula at the end of the movie, he mysteriously always rose from the grave, uh, there's just too much money invested in this and too much power to ever go away. <laughs> Uh, it's sort of like the Yale deconstruct deconstruction at Yale in the 80s. People said, does it really matter? I said, well, the Yale endowment means it matters. So uh, I think as, a, as a, just this functional matter, it's not going away, even though I don't think it has really much intellectual merit uh, at this point. I think you can uh, construct a spectrum going from originalist theory to genuine history, uh, and with originalist practice in the middle. Uh, and you know, I think what, in terms of originalist practice is the good, the bad, the ugly. Some people do it very well, some people do it very badly, and some people do it so badly it's not even polite to talk about it in, in uh, intellectual company. 
Um, we, of course, have traditional intentionalism who look at a variety of different groups, framers, ratifiers, founders, anti-federalists. Uh, we have the public many people who are divided into semantic originalists, original methods originalists, reasonable informed readers. Uh, I think, as I'll try and argue, the only way to save originalism from itself is for originalists to actually learn serious historical methodology and apply it. What they do with it is, of course, a legal matter, which as a historian, you know, I have my views as a citizen, but I claim no expertise. Uh, and then uh, I think that basically this uh, paradigm has such serious theoretical problems, we should just, you know, we should just sort of brush it onto the dust heap of history. This one has some very serious empirical problems, but at least it's not intellectually incoherent. Uh, and of course, this is where all the empirical solutions really lie, uh, fundamentally. <laughs> Uh, and of course, it's a gray zone of people who, whether they do it consciously or just because they're very good at it but not very self-reflective, do a very good job with the sources. And some of them do it subconsciously in a historical fashion, some of them not, but some of it's very good scholarship. Now, let's talk about some of the problems with the semantic model. Uh, this is right out of Larry Solomon's uh, essay. And basically, Rand Randy Burnett and Larry Solomon are sort of you know, on the same page on this. Uh, so what is the real methodology here? We talk about linguistic facts. We talk about dispensing with intentionality because the critique of traditional originalism as intentionalism was the summation problem and collective authorship, all of which raise questions about intentionality. Uh, and then we start to see, you know, of course, uh, Keith and I are talking about Larry Sons' work, it's a moving target, you know, it keeps on growing on SSRN uh, uh, into different incarnations. Uh, but he has slowly started to try and figure out what he means by context, and now he's talking about pragmatic enrichment. Uh, but fundamentally, the philosophers are saying the action is in the pragmatic enrichment, really not in the semantic setting. So the whole theory is kind of misguided in some profound sense. Uh, so how would we rearrange this if we actually paid attention to what the philosophers of language are saying? Well, what are semantic content and linguistic facts? They are really the regularities over patterns of intention of people using the language. So if you remember, the whole point of that brand of new originalism is to get around the summation problem. Essentially what it does is it pretends the summation doesn't, problem doesn't exist, calls something public meaning, looks up a few dictionaries, tries out a few databases, but it essentially doesn't really grapple with the problem of what do people intend to mean when they use sentences on particular pages, which is fundamentally what we do as historians. It's a difficult, complicated process. You don't always get a clean answer. But uh, we do have transparent methods where we can evaluate each other's work. The problem with public meaning originalism, it's all hocus pocus. There's really no methodology whatsoever. Um, most philosophers of language would tell you that the reason, uh, in sort of an ordinary conversation, we would assume when you say past the salt, you mean past the salt. Uh, so your original intent would correspond to the patterns of intentionality when people say salt and past. But of course, one of the problems is that we're not dealing with passing the salt, we're dealing with writing constitutions, which are very complicated, highly politicized uh, events. So there are lots of reasons why your original intent would not simply match because there's strategic concerns. You know, uh, Mary talked about Hamilton. Well, Hamilton is clearly speaking strategically so that he can influence the course of the debate. So just you know, looking up Hamilton's words in the dictionary wouldn't really tell you what Hamilton is doing by using that. And that's, of course, a point that Quentin Skinner makes. But most uh, people in the originalist camp don't understand Skinner, Skinner and have written some pretty nasty things about him, even though he's probably the most eminent uh, scholar writing about the history of political thought in the last 50 years. Um, uh, original methods originalism, of course, does worry about interpretive rules, although it tends to approach them somewhat anachronistically and somewhat uh, in terms of homo uh, homogeneity, which didn't exist. Very little attention to background assumptions, which are absolutely essential in terms of philosophy of language of sorting out what meaning means. I, I know Steve Sachs has done some interesting thing on background assumptions. We probably need more work on that. Uh, so really, although uh, the semantic theorists talk about uh, communicative uh, content, what we really need to do is communicative intent. And, and that is what the philosophers of language are saying. So we have people invoking the authority of philosophy of language who are getting the philosophy of language wrong. That's usually a bad sign. Uh, OK. Whose original methods? Uh, just to underscore, some of you may be familiar with this, uh, one of our images of uh, the polite and uh, serious intellectual discourse of the 1790s. Uh, you'll notice the person urinating in front of the speaker's chair and two people about to beat each other over the head with uh, canes. That comes from the famous Matthew Lyon uh, dust up at the end of the 1790s. I don't really know, uh, you know, in, in, in Heller, Justice Scalia says something rather nasty about Justice Stevens. Like, he says that people disagreed over stuff, whereas we all know that the constitutional bodies commonly assumed ideas that were universal. So the idea that the 
Pennsylvania descended of minority actually represented a minority view, it's just preposterous. Uh, uh, and Randy Barnett makes a similar argument. Uh, so the question is, whose original methods? Are they Blackstonian? Are they Madison? What day of the week is it Madison? As, as Mary's pointed out, it's another moving target. Uh, what about presuppositions? I mean, one of the most deeply uh, divisive issues of the day is whether or not the Constitution should be read against the background of Anglo-American law, or whether revolutionary ideology marks a sharp and complete break. So whose assumption are we going to use? Uh, questions about, does the law of nations actually, is that a context against which we read things or not? What about republicanism? What about, you know, sort of populist democracy, which is uh, nascent but still powerful in some places like Pennsylvania? Uh, and let's go to one of my favorite things, imaginary and fictive readers. What I find astonishing about this is reader response literary criticism was all the rage when I was in graduate school 30 years ago, and people quickly realized that what that amounted to was, was basically reading it the way you wanted to read it, or in your own imaginary bias, no, your own very unimaginary biases into your imaginary reader. Serious literary critics stopped doing reader response theory and started doing ethnographies of reading because they realized we need to study what actual readers do because generally speaking, they don't do what we want them to do as critics. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the best uh, expositions of this is Gary Lawson's, where he talks about what determines the meaning of the Constitution is not what people actually thought, but uh, an ideal construction of what we think they do. This, to me, is, is really legal theory as ventriloquism. I mean, this is basically uh, assuming that, you know, what we do when we interpret the Constitution is we imagine everyone was a member of the Federal Society, which of course they were, and then read the Constitution exactly that way. I mean, it, it, it really is just kind of preposterous. Uh, and the idea, as Jack was talking about in Heller, that this is really, you know, this is a joke, but this is actually the law of the land. I mean, the idea that, that they were actually thinking about the cheap availability of handguns is so preposterous for anyone who has an iota of knowledge of the period. I mean, if you look at malicious statutes, if you look at actually the kind of guns they owned, if you looked at almost any source available from the time, you could not come up with this conclusion unless you were just a historian. I mean, there's really just no other way to do it. You, you have to be working in a fantasy alternative universe. Um, sorry about that. Uh, and of course, the key is the descent of the minority, which Justice Scalia uses to basically uh, assert that uh, Barry Barnes is not about use of guns in the military context because in this one text, they actually do talk about hunting. Well, as you learned on the first day of history grad school, who believed it? Who did they represent? Who are these people? The idea that in one of Randy's articles, he says, just because they were the you know, descent of the minority means they were actually a minority is unproven. Well, it's only unproven if you haven't done any historical work because it's so obviously true to every historian that you wouldn't need to, to cite that. It's just, it's just so obviously clear. Uh, I actually, in a recent article, give you about 25 reasons why it's true. But if you actually just read the head note in the document introduced to you the ratification of the Constitution, it's very clear uh, that this text was not uh, sort of typical of the day. It was quite unusual for the day. So uh, what do we have here? Uh, just as a matter of constitutional theory, how could imaginary readers provide any kind of popular sovereignty foundation for our Constitution? Imaginary readers didn't ratify it. I mean, it's, there's, there's no foundation for it. It's a modern invention. I mean, it's a fine fiction. And of course, the law is filled with fine fictions. Uh, but the question is, <clears throat> famously, we talk about this, the reasonable man on the street. That used to be the man on the platform omnibus. If you look up Clapham, you'll realize that the man on the platform omnibus now has a home worth 1.5 million pounds. Uh, and probably the man on the platform omnibus probably now lives in Brixton and is probably actually an Afro-Caribbean woman. So uh, you know, the whole idea of the reasonable person while it's a useful fiction, has come under a lot of fire in various areas of the law. I think to import it into originalism is to take one of the most problematic legal fictions and use it in a very un, uh, unhistorically sound way. So where does this all lead us? Uh, to borrow my colleague uh, Martin Flaherty, we need to start doing history right, because we've been doing it right uh, at best. Uh, and so here's my sort of very simplified model. So if that's what the Constitutional Convention represented, by the way, it's not that beautiful picture of like, light shining under George Washington, which is a 19th century romantic image. That's the only contemporary image of the Constitutional Convention we have, actually, uh, from a contemporary almanac. Uh, we have to accept that there are multiple intents, and whether or not you can sum those intents is, of course, still an open question, that people are engaged in strategic, not sort of ordinary speech. Uh, this is one of the few political cartoons we have of ratification, which looks a little bit different than our idea of 
the Federalist and Federal Farm are debating in philosophical niceties. Uh, not that it's not important, but it's important to realize about 12 people read the Federalist at the time. Uh, you know, uh, it, it was not printed widely known on New York, and its actual impact on New York ratification, according to most historians, of course, is minimal, although it did eventually join the canon of constitutional text, and you know, by the, by the uh, I don't know, within a decade or two, it was an important text. Uh, and of course, there's everything else. You know, you have to, you gotta read your Harrington, you gotta read those newspapers, you gotta look at what's going on in state politics. Let's not forget Locke and Sydney and Blackstone. And that's just a simple model of what you need to do if you're gonna do anything in this field. And frankly, I don't, just don't think most originalism rises to that level of seriousness intellectually. I mean, there's some great originalism does, but by and large, uh, it's, just not, it's just not really good. Uh, people have to, I think, if they're gonna be serious, they have to do some very serious history, and they haven't done so yet. Uh, so where does this leave us? I was actually going to play the song by the Who, uh, Meet Me in the Boss, same as the old boss, one of the great rock anthems. Uh, so the major historical critique of originalism, there's been a lot of blogging about, you know, why do historians say we can't understand the past, and they write amicus briefs and stuff like this. Well, first of all, amicus briefs are different than writing historical articles. Different rules apply. But fundamentally, the, the critique was not epistemological. If it was, we'd be out of business as historians. It was always empirical. Uh, secondly, uh, I think public meaning originalism is, as Larry Alexander charges, fundamentally parasitic on traditional intentionalism. Uh, despite the claims to the contrary, and talk about linguistic facts, there is no hard, transparent methodology that originalists can point to that is subject to professional uh, investigation, you can't, you, know, you can't see it in any of the originalist theory. There is no guide to how you weigh the source, for instance. Uh, and fundamentally, I think rather than great strides forward, which many originalists have said we made, we're basically where we've always been. We've actually made almost no progress in terms of the theory. And uh, the only hope, I think, for the theory is to actually uh, instantiate in, in law school some very serious training in history. Otherwise, people are going to do the same old thing again and again. And I think uh, history doesn't tell you what the law means, but to understand what the law meant at a historical moment is a historical exercise. Uh, and I think until we see a greater sophistication, we're going to see a lot more law office history, and uh, we're just going to sort of play the same game as we've always played. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> Well, I don't have a PowerPoint. I just have an old-fashioned handout because I'm one of these <laughs> old-fashioned originalists. Um, I'm really honored to be here, and I'm really happy to be here. It reached a high of four below t yesterday in Minnesota. <laughs> My garage door broke. I had trouble getting to the airport. So really, 24, 48 hours in uh, Northern California. Bring on the rain. It's really <laughs> and, and I'm really honored to be here with such a distinguished panel and see so many uh, old friends and, and new friends. Um, <clears throat> so the panel topic is originalist methodology. And so I, what I thought I'd do quite audaciously is I try to sketch out what I thought was correct originalist methodology and see if I could do that in 15 minutes. Uh, I'll give you a preview of where I'm coming at. I, I think I really am Saul Cornell's vampire. And you can tell by the white skin, especially gets really pasty in the Minnesota winters. But I am one of these old originalists. Here, in a nutshell, is, is my theory. It's, it's more of the uh, objective, reasonable person, certainly. Uh, I think that the, the task, the enterprise of constitutional interpretation Okay, of explicating the text, basically uh, is one of attempting to discern the objective original meaning that the words would have had in social and linguistic context, taking into account history to the sort of generic, average, reasonably intelligent speaker and reader of the English language at the time that the document was, was adopted. Um, as I was looking over my my outline at the airport, I realized that on my whole first page, I didn't use the word constitution. And it occurred to me that this is actually the method you would use for interpreting just about any nonfiction oral or written communication. It could apply to scriptural interpretation. It could apply to other forms of legal documents. That interpreting the text is a matter of discerning the actual meaning of the words and the words they would have had at the time that they were, they were written down. 
Um, the second half of my thesis is that there's a separate enterprise called constitutional adjudication or, or application. And my thesis there is that the task or enterprise of constitutional adjudication consists of applying the original linguistic public meaning of the document to lawsuits in which there's presented a question of constitutional meaning on which the resolution of the dispute turns. Now, that's not something you would have to do, and you would have to, I draw a distinction between interpreting documents and deciding to apply it and how to apply it. And of course, there are some slips, some further steps between understanding what the document means and what you do with it in practice. And that's my distinction between interpretation and appropriation, or, or if, if you're going to be technical about it, academic -y. The distinction I draw is between exegesis of the text and hermeneutics, how you appropriate it and apply it in concrete circumstances. It roughly tracks onto Larry Solom's distinction between interpretation and construction, but I think it's a, actually a more precise term because construction tends to bleed over into what we understand as interpretation and interpretation, you know, the two have become so mushed together, notwithstanding Keith Whittington's excellent attempts to keep them separate. Uh, but I think the, the actual distinction is between textual exegesis, understanding the meaning of the words, and then hermeneutics, what you choose to do with them once you get the meaning, okay? So first, uh, five minutes, six minutes on the task of interpretation. I think the task of interpretation is to ascertain the objective, original public meaning of the text, the meaning the words would have had to ordinary speakers and readers of the English language at about the time that they were doing it. Now, I think it is an objective inquiry into textual meaning. Now, I think there's something to be said for the fact that original public meaning textual interpretation is somewhat derivative or a successor, or parasitic is probably too strong a term, of intentionalism. I think it's a successor theory in part because if you are interpreting a text, the theory is you're not trying to ascertain anyone in particular's intention or understanding because presumably the task of producing a written constitution was designed to reduce the understanding or intention to some sort of linguistic artifact, right? To, to boil it down to a set of words that we could all read and attempt to understand. Now the task of, interp of understanding uh, what that is basically makes it n the interpretive enterprise not one of figuring out what anybody in particular meant still less what we would like it to mean, okay? But the task of sort of constructing an objective meaning. It's actually very close to what uh, uh, Gary Lawson described and what Saul Cornell uh, lampooned. Um, <clears throat> so the distinction then, I think, in terms of correct originalism is between original meaning and original intention. The ideas of intention, history, context, properly inform the inquiry into original meaning. Okay. Um, objective meaning, and then the next step is that it's original meaning. Okay. That is basically, we attempt first to understand the meaning the words would have had at the time they were written to the audience to whom they were written as a defense against linguistic anachronism. Right. We can't just change the meanings of words or let the meanings of words change, or we are basically abandoning the project of written constitutionalism. The words had a definite meaning, and if we just Humpty Dumpty-like bring our own meanings to them and change them over time, we're basically permitting a form of constitutional amendment. We might choose to do that in practice, but if the first task is to ascertain textual meaning, I think you have to start with the original meaning. History rightfully has a role in that. A number of years back, Vasen Kesevan and I wrote an article um, about the what is the authoritative weight, what is the status of the, uh, the, the records of the Constitutional Convention. Now, they were secret records, right? The drafting history was not made available to the ratifiers, but still, it is a wonderful concordance uh, 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 operational description of what was the understanding of the meaning of the words and concepts that the framers were using at the time. History is relevant to discerning meaning. 
It tells you the context. It tells you what people's usages of the words meant. And it can illustrate many of the concepts for which otherwise the bare language would be ambiguous. And it's a good check against linguistic drift. Okay. So there is a role for, for history. And we do need to get better at it in terms of explicating textual meaning. But the object is not to understand specifically the history. The object is to use the history as evidence of the meaning of the words, because that's what we're supposedly interpreting as this authoritative written text. Further rules for explicating textual meaning. You have to look at the whole text. You look at arguments from structure, relationship or provisions. Ours is a system of separated powers that has certain implications. I think of structural arguments as basically a sophisticated form of textual arguments. It's the classic John Marshall method in Marbury versus Madison, McCulloch versus Maryland. They're sort of inferential textual arguments. Similarly, you look at the t whole text in context. You do look at background assumptions and premises and conceptions. And finally, I think it is legitimate in terms of explicating the meaning of the Constitution to use sort of a deductive reasoning process. Now, uh, there's a reason many of us are not in the hard sciences, but I do recall a little high school <laughs> geometry, and, and I, I kind of liked it then, of like, you, you find a postulate, and you can reason through two theorems. And if your premises are right, and if your reasoning process is right, you can reach specific conclusions that are correct if the initial premises are right. I think that applies to constitutional reasoning, too. If you can come up with a sufficiently determinate proposition of law, you may derive other correct propositions from it that may be right, even if they do not correspond to anybody's specific intentions or expectations. Now, it's not a perfect method. It's a method working itself pure. Um, but it is that, I think, is basically the core of attempting to understand uh, uh, textual meaning. Uh, an important point to this is that for the textualist, for the original public meaning textualist, the implications in terms of outcomes have to be totally irrelevant. They are irrelevant to the task of faithful textual interpretation. We still have to get to what we do with the textual meaning, what we have. It. You apply these sorts of methodological steps and I think that any honest interpreter, even an honest uh, textualist, will say that, that produce, there are some areas where you will have indeterminacy, ambiguity, uncertainty, and even absurdity sometimes. What is the implication of the fact that sometimes when you interpret the text, you produce an indeterminate consequence, or the text you find that the text is ambiguous. Well, I think that the, the, the meaning of indeterminacy and ambiguity is indeterminacy and ambiguity. Sometimes you apply this method, and you don't have a determinate answer, but maybe a range of meaning that the constitutional provision would bear. Where the Constitution has a range of meaning, then I think you need to go to sort of second order rules to figure out what you do with indeterminacy and uncertainty as a practical matter once you come to applying the Constitution. That's turn the page uh, to the question of hermeneutic principles. What do you do with the text once you have it? Now, one thing you could do is you could just ignore it. You could treat the Constitution as just sort of this interesting historical artifact. I think that when you, you know, interpret the Constitution, uh, you might apply to it the same principles that you would apply when interpreting the Articles of Confederation. First, you read it to try to understand what it says, and that's an enterprise separate from the question of whether you decide to apply it as law. Um, <clears throat> the decision to be bound and apply the Constitution as law is essentially a political decision extrinsic to the question of textual meaning. I don't regard it as at all impossible that you could say, well, we shouldn't be bound by this written Constitution. Why, in principle, should we be bound by something that was produced by dead white males 225 years ago? Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, one of the questioners in the first panel, Mr. Bar Bannister, uh, asked the question about dead hand of the past uh, interpretation. Well, I think the premise of written constitutionalism actually is dead hand of the past, putting a stake in the ground and saying, by virtue of a decision made authoritatively once before, we will follow it again. Okay? Uh, written constitutionalism is dead hand of the past originalism. 
oh, bring it to a close, but I've got, I've got half my page. Okay, <laughs> we'll go into two minute drill. <laughs> Once you've decided what to be bound by a constitution, if you've sworn an oath to uphold it, you've gotten past the, dis the question of whether or not you are going to apply this constitution. And then the question is, what do you do with it? A couple of quick points. If the constitution is law, you apply it as you would a legal document. Where the document states a sufficiently determinate rule, you apply that rule. That's what gets you the idea of judicial review. The whole idea of judicial review is that where the Constitution supplies a sufficiently determinate rule that the political branches have violated, you go with the Constitution and not what the political branches have done. Next, you need a rule of what to do where the Constitution does not supply a sufficiently determinate rule. I think that the answer there is that where the Constitution does not supply a rule, it does not supply a rule, and you cannot invalidate what someone else has done on the basis of an assertion by the courts that it is inconsistent with the Constitution. If the constitutional provision has a range of meaning and a legislative or executive body has acted somewhere within that range of meaning, a range of indeterminacy, the theorem of judicial review does not allow you to invalidate it. So I think a consequence of indeterminacy should be to default more to the political branches, and that's actually consistent with another structural principle of the Constitution, which is its preference for Republican representative governments. Finally, you need a theory. Now, this is a whole panel for, for, for tomorrow, so I won't preempt everything. This well, well, OK, yes, I will. I'll preempt everything. <laughs> Finally, you need a hermeneutic theory of what you do when the text conflicts with the practice. Right? Um, <clears throat> that's the whole uh, liquidation panel. Uh, I'll give you the short version of my theory, and then you can uh, grill me on it in the, in the question and answer period. The Constitution does not specify a rule of construction favoring stare decisis. There's actually no textual, historical, or structural support for stare decisis in the strong sense of adhering to what you would otherwise conclude is an erroneous prior decision. In fact, my view is that if you are an original meaning textualist, stare decisis in that aggressive sense is actually unconstitutional. Think about it. The Constitution, if you can discern a rule, says one thing, and a judicial precedent says another, contrary to it. That's the Marbury theorem of judicial review, right? Where the Constitution supplies a rule, and a political actor or a governmental actor of any kind has acted contrary to it, you go with the Constitution and not the faithless departure from original meaning. Okay, now, now I'm really given the hook, and I'll pass it on. Thank you. Okay, so not counting in my 15 minutes, a couple of words of uh, why I'm here, what I'm doing here, uh, as the one non-American, I think, at the conference. Um, First, let me say, as a non-American, of course, my views about the originalism debate are entirely um, detached from the deep occurrence of the debate, and I, I, have, I take no position on the question of the merits. Um, I do come from a country which has a constitution largely modeled on the US Constitution, written in the 1890s. Um, I could tell you at great length about the process, which I've written about. Um, and uh, a country whose high court, the equivalent of your Supreme Court, uh, routinely, perhaps at least regularly, draws on US um, jurisprudence in enlightening its own constitutional interpretation and the whole relationship between the history of the US Constitution and the Australian Constitution is a much discussed topic um, in Australia. Um, uh, and uh, let me also just add, uh, as, a, as a sort of a note of my CV, I'm a law professor, but I have a PhD in history. Um, and what I want to talk about is actually not about the law, but about the discipline of history. Uh, and I, I, I want to uh, take uh, the advantage of the take advantage of the, the the fact that the word history is in the title of the Constitution um, to detach it from. Uh, a discussion of constitutional interpretation and indeed to challenge the whole premise that originalism and constitutional interpretation not only validly uses history um, but to, to, to challenge this by asserting that originalists, that despite the claim they may deal in history, don't deal in history. 
and can't deal in history. And I want to say, in a matter of the 15 minutes, which I hope stop now, um, from this um, otherworldly perspective, uh, why history is different from constitutional law and, and indeed why it is virtually impossible for history to assist constitutional interpretation. And when originalists make a claim, whether they're good originalists or not, when they make a claim in the name of history, they need to understand that they're doing something different. So my starting point is the observation that all originalists, whether old or new, or all of the multiple varieties, and I think Mitchell Berman has counted something like 72 iterations, uh, all originalists assume that legal answers can be found in history, and, and I think they're wrong. Um, now, you might think I'm going to say they're wrong because um, history is indeterminate, and with history the jury is always out, that indeterminacy about the past and what it means uh, is the reason constitutional interpretation can't rely on it. I'm not. Actually, I find the whole indeterminacy argument trite and a bit boring and largely unhelpful. History might be open-ended um, in the sense of open to new discoveries and new ways of understanding relevant material, um, and it's also frequently contested, but the proposition that one can't determine what went on in the past, including intentions in the past, is a facile proposition. It's something mostly said by non-historians, and if historians say it, they don't actually believe it, at least not about their own work. <laughs> <laughs> they, know, they know because it is their job to find out that certain things did happen in the past, that people thought and wanted and intended certain things, and historians believe, and if they've done their job well, they are entitled to believe that their account is at least a lot better, a lot sounder than that of the non-historians who haven't done the job at all. Those who claim that history can't uh, enlighten constitutional law because history is indeterminate, Paul Brest makes that ar um, argument and others do, are implying that all historical claims are equivalent and they are letting off the hook the non-historians who are more than happy to make claims about the past on the basis, quite often, of nothing more than a guess. Now, if it's true that old original, old original intent originalists have been converted into new original public meaning originalists because they've been persuaded by the indeterminacy argument that original intentions can't be uncovered, I think they've given up too easily. It is possible to know what historical individuals thought, planned, imagined, and intended, and it is also possible to know whether those indivi historical individuals who left a record of what they thought, planned, imagined, and intended, and a lot did, were more or less representative of the relevant contemporary elite, or the demographic subset, or the whole public, depending on what you're looking for. Historians, and I'm certainly not the first to observe this, do this all the time. They research the past by looking at the record of the past, and a significant part of the record lies in the record left by individuals. So I would say to those conviction originalists who feel embarrassed to make a claim about how much we can know with certainty, relax, don't stop being an old originalist just because you think it is simple-minded, simple to use Larry Alexander's term, or naive. Stick to what you really want to know which is what people intended. If it's any comfort, original public meaning originalists don't know either and are no less naive. So I agree with the various critics who maintain that the new originalism, public meaning originalism, isn't going to get you any further than the old originalism. And I also agree with Professor Cornell that there is a serious methodological lacuna in most contributions to the originalism debate and I wrote about it in an article that was published last year. And that if you were going to choose a historical sub-methodology to explain what people thought they were doing when they wrote the words of the Constitution, modern contextualist intellectual history is the choice. But my skepticism about the alleged virtues of originalist public meaning originalism goes further. I doubt that history can be used at all for the purpose of constitutional interpretation. My argument has four subheadings, quickly. First, history is an epistemology. Second, history is not instrumental. Third, doing history is a skeptical art. And fourth, doing history takes a lot of time. So first, history is an epistemology. Doing history is not like collecting shells. 
History is a particular type of reasoning. The reasoning and the doing are part of the same process. The questions asked by historians are historical questions. The questions shape the understanding. The answers are historical answers, not legal answers. Historians cannot tell you whether a law passed in 2014 with all the modern interests, language, perspectives of the present captured in it is constitutionally valid or invalid. It, that is not a historical question. Historians show us how the past is different from the present and they try to explain why it is. Originalists maintain that the past should not be different from the present. Their concern is non-change, whereas the concern of historians is change. Secondly, history is not instrumental. This proposition follows from the first. History that lends itself to a particular purpose, the purpose of deciding whether a modern law is or is not constitutionally valid, for example, ceases to be history. Professor Rakoff has written that it is not the province of the historian to decide questions of law. But he adds that historical knowledge can give constitutional interpretation the rigor it, also, it, it, it often lacks. And I'm not sure that that second proposition follows. If judges use history to provide answers to legal questions, they are ceasing to be judges. They are outsourcing their work, allowing historians to stand in their shoes and to write the law. This is not the legitimate role of either. Third, history is a skeptical art. Historical research must be done skeptically, with a determination not to believe or conclude anything until the historical picture is built up upon multiple sources and multiple perspectives, until the record has been cross-examined and corroborated many times. Historians never rely on the accounts of others. They examine and re-examine the records. They must always be on the alert for tendentiousness and especially wary of historical accounts that politicians make use of. If a historical account gives comfort to a politician, then it should probably be rewritten. The instrumental use of history is entirely at odds with the skeptical discipline required of the historian. Fourth, history takes a lot of time. Now, if none of my other points is persuasive or if the uh, dis disciplinary difficulties are just experienced as mild discomforts, Originalists might at least take that point seriously. If they really believe that judges should be faithful to history, they must genuinely want to get the history right. And to do this requires meticulousness and diligence and patience and years of work. Judges don't have that sort of time. Now many judges, I won't speak for the United States, but in Australia at any rate, seem to think that history can be done easily and quickly especially now that many records are available that were not available in the past. So the Australian Constitution was written uh, at conventions in the 1890s, which were open to the public, and there were Hansard reporters there. And the entire Hansard record of the federal conventions, uh, around 6,000 pages of debates, is now digitized and online, and it's now very easy for uh, a judge or the judge's clerk to search for keywords or the names of convention de delegates to find out what was said in the course of a debate about particular constitutional provisions. And typically, strangely enough, and I'm sure this never happens in the United States, the justices of the High Court gravitate what was towards what was said by the notables, in particular the five convention delegates who were later appointed as justices of the High Court. Now, doing that is not doing history any more than looking up a dictionary definition of a term or reading a selected passage of Blackstone is doing history. Speed history is not history. Now this is not to say that judges can never do extra, extra curial history. Some indeed may have been trained as historians before they entered the legal profession. But even trained uh, uh, that way, can't, they, they can't spend years researching the history of a particular constitutional provision applied to a real life dispute, that would be simply incompatible with the legitimate expectations of the parties, not to mention the judicial task. Judges have limited time to reach conclusions. So should the time poor judge rely on the work already done by the time rich historian? Well, for the reasons I've pointed out, the answer is no. At the very least, however, 
if judges allow themselves to use history, to use secondary histories to, to, to reach their legal conclusions, they should say why they have chosen particular historians over others and on what basis they have found one historical account to be more persuasive than another. If the reason is that the favoured historian has reached a conclusion that the judge had already reached, then the judge should ditch the history and get straight to the conclusion. If the reason is that the judge has read and compared all the alternative historical accounts and has been persuaded by the scholarship and the thoroughness and the mastery, etc., of one over others, that's certainly better. But still, the objection follows. The historian should not be settling legal questions. So what's my conclusion? History should be used only very rarely, if at all. Now, I say rarely rather than never because I'm thinking of one particular Australian constitutional case where history was finally the only way to settle a long-running dispute about the meaning of a particular provision. The provision, section 92 of the Australian Constitution, says that after the Federation of the Australian States, which happened in 1901, trade, commerce and intercourse among the states shall be absolutely free. It's essentially the Australian written version of the Dormant Commerce Clause. But what did absolutely free mean? So for close to a century, again and again, the High Court scratched its head over this question. It was the most litigated section of the Constitution. Absolutely free couldn't possibly have meant literally what it said, that there should be no regulation of any sort of trade and commerce. But did it mean that there should be no national economic regulation, or that Australia had to have a free market economy, or that individual traders whose businesses crossed state borders had a right to trade without restrictions on their interstate business. All of these uh, accounts, all of these alternatives were tried out at one time or another. And the fact was that there was simply no legal answer to the question and nor was there stable precedent. Absolutely free is not a legal expression. So finally, the High Court in 1988 decided to look at historians' account, accounts and to find out what we would now call the, the original public meaning of the provision. The court, in a very rare case of unanimity, the unanimous court was persuaded that it meant nothing more than that no state could impose upon the trade or commerce of another state or states a discriminatory burden of a protectionist kind. A state could, it turned out, because the case concerned the importation of undersized crayfish from one state to another, it could impose burdens to protect local natural resources or rare native species. Does this sound familiar? Maine versus Taylor decided only two years earlier. Just so long as the intention or the effect of the challenged state law was not to discriminate against out of state trade and commerce in order to protect the industry of the legislating state. Now in reaching this conclusion, the court could have been said to have followed the ordinary common law rules of statutory construction. And I hear these, uh, these rules implied in uh, what uh, some of Professor Paulson's uh, views about uh, constitutional interpretation amounted to. Give the words of an instrument their plain and natural meaning and follow the plain and natural meaning unless it leads to an injustice or is ambiguous or produces an absurdity, which the plain and natural meaning of absolutely free would have done. If this dis doesn't work, then you go through other steps to find out the legislative purpose. And if that is still unclear, then recourse to extrinsic materials is permitted. And I think these rules of statutory uh, interpretation, common law rules apply in Britain and in, uh, in Australia and, and in the US, they're, they're, they're common law um, in common law jurisdictions. Now these materials, the extrinsic materials to which uh, an interpreter can, a judge can have recourse, include certain limited sorts of historical record. The, the reports of committees, second reading speeches, the convention debates. And the High Court drew on these, but drew primarily upon uh, secondary uh, sources. And here it made a mistake. It fell short of what it was permitted to do. 
There were many disciplinary mistakes with respect to the doing of history in what the High Court did. And anyway, secondary histories are not included in the extrinsic materials that are authorized uh, under statutory interpretation. Now, the High Court got away with it in 1988 because the decision was unanimous. There were few living historians at the time who had any interest in the received historical interpretation of Section 92. And because the use of history was new in the court and nobody really knew how far this could legitimately go. So here the most charitable thing one can say about the methodology is that the court, desperate to settle an otherwise endless dispute, used history or used secondary historical accounts effectively as a tiebreaker, a type of heuristic like tossing a coin and agreeing that whatever this revealed would be what the disputed constitutional provision meant. They used it once. They've applied that conclusion in Section 92 cases since, but they've never used that methodology again, for r rightly or wrongly. But in any case, using history in this sense as a tiebreaker is not doing history. Thank you. Oh, well, I thank the, uh, the speakers. I, as, I, as I see it, we have interestingly uh, 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 interesting clashes uh, in which, uh, if I understand Saul Cornell correctly, he is speaking only to the historical questions and not really to questions of interpretation. And his principal uh, claim is that many of the uh, methodological moves of the new originalism amount to bad history. Um, I hear uh, Helen uh, as uh, going to somewhat more fundamental questions and is essentially saying that even if history is done well, if, even if it's done properly, uh, that it should not be uh, used in, in, in uh, legal interpretation. Uh, I'm, uh, and then I hear uh, Keith Whittington giving a very sophisticated political theory grounding for originalism and I think primarily of the new originalist model, although I didn't, I'm not quite sure how much uh, of the paper there uh, uh, distinguishes. It may be a, a bridge between uh, old and new. And then I hear uh, Michael Paulson speaking almost exclusively as a lawyer and not as a historian and talking about why a particular moves regarding history are necessary for the logic of of judicial review and constitutionalism. So uh, they seem to be uh, talking about the same things, but in some ways we have four ships uh, uh, passing in the night. <laughs> and so what, I've, what I would like to do is in, is in particular ways to invite uh, each of them uh, to, uh, uh, to, to have some uh, uh, intercourse with the, with the other ships as they're passing uh, uh, in the night. And so in particular, let's, um, uh, let's begin with Saul Cornell. And I'm curious, uh, if, if history were done well, and by the way, I agreed with many of your critiques of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, new originalist methodology. And I particularly agreed with Helen Irving's comment that if uh, that to the extent that history should be done, that it ought to be understood as a, uh, as a form of contextual intellectual history. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that all too often, I think the linguistic move has been disturbing in that it, it does tend to take uh, originalism away from the question of, of uh, what were the traditions of thought within English and uh, both legal and, and political thought that are being debated at the time, which seems to me to be uh, much the most important thing. But um, so Saul, when history is done well, and you imply that there is a good as well as a bad and an ugly, uh, uh, should, it, <laughs> should ju judges make use of it? Well, uh, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm persuaded uh, by the, m the multiple modalities. It seems to me that there is a strong tradition of using history, uh, 
and that history has not just been the history of the founding, but really history broadly construed so that it includes the full, I mean, a lot of 14th Amendment uh, approaches to history are the traditions of our people, the long durée, if you will, even though we're a pretty short durée country. Uh, and I, I didn't mention Jack Balkin's uh, essay in this Fordham Symposium, but he actually tried to rescue history from originalism by arguing that, in fact, history didn't stop at the founding or didn't stop and then start again around uh, the 14th Amendment and then stop again, that actually there is a broad sweep of American history. So, you know, I think my general view is uh, history because the founders were very interesting thinkers and because they started our tradition, they are a very important part of the story. Uh, but this is one of the advantages about uh, being a historian is uh, you get to revel in irony and uncertainty. And I, I'm not sure that anyone has ever filed an ironic brief before the Supreme Court. So I am aware that our job description is one of the reasons why we you know, get that excellent uh, take-home pay that you know rivals that of typical law professors that we don't actually at the end of the day have to come up with a decision we can actually enjoy the ambiguity the complexity and say here's the mess now you deal with it <laughs> well uh, so let me ask Keith a question which is um, we've heard a lot about old originalism and new originalism and you your work is associated at least with, at least with trying to unpack new originalism can you tell us Somewhat concisely, what do you think is the major contribution of new originalism as opposed to old? Oh, well, I was going to take um, uh, Saul's or suggestion. Or say what else? Everyone. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, I was going to say I was going to take Saul's suggestion and, and plant my flag in chunky monkey originalism from here on out, and hope to <laughs> rally to that. Um, so, so yeah. So I think the move from from and and I. Probably say a bit about this tomorrow as well, but I think the move from from old to new originalism is partially about, um, though some would highlight it more than I would, uh, the distinction between sort of plain meaning originalism versus emphasis on intent. I am more of a big tent kind of guy when it comes to intent um, versus uh, plain meaning and and tend not to draw sharp um, sharp distinctions along those lines. I think that in I think part of what though got emphasized in making that move is a de-emphasis on concrete what's people like uh, Balkan want to call concrete intentions, right? The goal of really thinking about what are the applications people have in mind and how authoritative um, are those applications in the future. And I think there has been a general move away from that, and that's probably for the best. Um, I think the other kind of significant departure between two other distinctions between uh, old and new originalism that are probably notable, one is between sort of an attachment of originalism to ideas of judicial restraint, which I think have now largely been abandoned out of newer, more recent versions um, of originalism. Um, and I think a greater appreciation for indeterminacy in um, constitutional meaning from original perspective and what you do with that, uh, which I think tended to get backgrounded in um, older theories of originalism, I think are, is more in the foreground um, of, of more recent theories. So Michael Paulson, that uh, two re very closely related questions. Uh, one is that you say that uh, that oftentimes we're going to find a range of meaning rather than a meaning, and that your solution to the range of meaning problem is not, that the, the interpreter should not try to identify the best, but rather should accept the range and decide cases within that range by other methods. That might be subsequent history, it might be precedent, it might be, uh, but in the end, if there's not some conclusive answer, uh, we go with what the legislature said. Now that I think reconnects. If you're in, that reconnects originalism with uh, with judicial restraint, not as a kind of fundamental and epistemological or interpretive principle, but rather as a step in uh, in uh, in adjudication. I wonder if you would accept that. But also, what do we do if it turns out? Uh, that there are range, very significant ranges of meaning, not of course for most questions, but for most questions that we are, that are actually in contention. So that, I mean, we don't get to the Supreme Court on things that are obvious. We get to the Supreme Court on things that are in contention. And if, if it turns out that range of meaning tends, is the characteristic answer, doesn't that effectively read the originalism piece out of your interpretive method, leaving us mostly with judicial restraint. 
You have so many questions, Michael. Uh, <clears throat> I say it's all one question. It's all one question. <laughs> <laughs> There's subparts to the question. <laughs> um, I, well, I think what you said it, it, is a fairly good paraphrase of my position. Let me quibble with a couple points. It's not judicial restraint driven. It's more like once you've applied and then what you've once you've applied what you think is a correct interpretive legal methodology, seeking to ascertain the meaning of the words in context, perhaps informed by history, once you've done your best to interpret it, I think you have to concede, and most originalists would concede, that sometimes, sometimes that produces a determinate point, right? What's the meaning of 35 years of age? Oh, I know you can argue about what does 35 mean to it. But some provisions have a determinate point, and some provisions really have sort of this, this box, okay? Irreducibly, once you've applied a faithful interpretive method, even if you're originalist. Um, I don't think it's driven by an idea that judiciary should restrain itself in terms of any sort of like a policy preference, any sort of natural conservatism, as that the theory of judicial review as an inference from the text only gets you so far. It only gets you to the point that judges have a constitutional power to invalidate actions of legislative and executive bodies that are inconsistent with the rule in the text. Now, if you can't get all the way to saying that it's inconsistent with the rule in the text, then you can't say that there's a judicial power to invalidate what the legislature has done. So um, <clears throat> but that actually gets to, to your to your second question is like, you know, does that mean that, you know, it, what, what do you do if on many of the issues we care about most, there's actually a significant range of interpretive uh, possibility? I think that it does mean that the more indeterminate a text, the less judicial license there is to substitute its view for something the legislature has done, because that's an intrinsic limitation on the nature of the theory of judicial review. And that the further we get from questions that are determined by original meaning, the more room it leaves for the live hand of the present to legislate and act. So I think that it, as a consequence, it's, the more you can say that texts are indeterminate, the more functionally the default rule has to be that the, the branch that gets to do the construction, the application, will be the legislature or the executive. By indeterminate, you're not meaning, I think, what Helen was criticizing. I think what you're saying is that when we know a great deal about history and actually have answers, the answer is that there were two major views that were not, at least two, maybe a range of views that were not, in fact, resolved, but instead all were comprehended by a text which uh, which did not resolve them, which is not, I think, the, I think, Helen, that that's not the view you were criticizing, right? The, the idea that I was not criticizing the view that um, there are multiple possible meanings attached to a text which is otherwise not clear and unambiguous. That's the way I read you, too, which, which is different from saying we just can't know things. We can oh, know, know things, yeah, sure. but the conclusion, the thing that we might know is that there was a range of views, all of which are comprehended by the ultimate text that's, that's the question determined. Is whether, that, whether what we can know is helpful to determining legal decisions. Um, and, and my answer is we, we can know all sorts of things about what went on um, in a particular period and when a particular process was occurring that led to the writing of a particular constitution. We can know all sorts of things at all sorts of levels of generality and specificity. Um, the, we, can, we can know a lot about the people who wrote the words. Um, when it comes to interpreting the words, sure, some, in some cases, uh, as in my absolutely free example, um, the, the law itself doesn't provide an answer. Precedent doesn't provide an answer. Um, the, the discourse of law doesn't provide an answer and so there's a sort of a, a desperation to resolve a particular question in a way which is going to have legal authority. Um, but my point um, about the, the mismatch between history and law 
is that law and it's it's a different it's it's a, a different discourse. It's a different epistemology. It has a different task to perform, and that the meanings that one can find in history when they are turned into the words in a constitution, the words become juristic subjects, and that means that they are then subject to a different type of reasoning, uh, a different uh, uh, they, they belong in a different epistemological universe from the explanations one can find in history. Um, so sure, um, some words and some terms in a constitution are indeterminate, uh, under, indeterminate or undeterminate. Um, I, I, I would say that um, to the extent that one cannot, um, that they don't have the same interpretive clarity as the clear, the words that have a plain and, and, and natural meaning. The recourse should not be to history in that proper disciplinary sense, but uh, the attempt should be to ground conclusions about those undeterminate or indeterminate words or, or terms in the historical discipline, the, the legal discipline itself. Um, so precedent, for example, is um, a, 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 much, a much sounder uh, here, I, I, um, I'm very persuaded by the argument of David Strauss here that it's a much sounder, much more grounded, much more faithful to the past method of determining the meaning of otherwise difficult to determine uh, words in, a, in an instrument. So, so you, yeah, just one, uh, thinking back to Ted White's very elegant sketch of the history of history and constitutional thought, what I find remarkable about uh, what Michael Paulson said is he's pre-modern. Because pe yeah. really, since pragmatism in America and Thank Wittgenstein, you. Thank uh, you very much. nobody <laughs> believes in objective meaning. Everyone believes in intersubjective meaning. And so I'm just astonished that he's pre-modern. I mean, it's kind of like a fossil. I mean, it's, it's just astonishing to me that anyone in this day and age actually believes in objective meaning. Well, astonishment is a good thing. It is, it is. Yeah. It keeps so, us young. Um, uh, and those who want to come, why don't you come to the uh, um, microphones and add, but as you do, <laughs> let me throw one last question to Helen, which is, okay, okay, history doesn't work very well. Uh, in law, but what what does I I think, for example, of Ronald Dworkin, who says we should look more to moral philosophy. But it too takes a lot of time. It too <laughs> should be skeptical. It, it seems as though everything, uh, and, and we could talk about precedent. Uh, everything is subject to something like the critique that you give, and yet judges have a duty to decide the cases. They have a duty to decide the case according to the law. Um, and I'm not postulating a, a, a sort of a, an ontological universe of objective, of object, of objective legal concepts or, or, or rules. Um, the, the duty, there, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons that judges have a duty to apply the law, partly because that's what their job description is. Um, but um, uh, so as far as possible, um, judges should apply reasons that are drawn from legal, from the, from the discursive universe of, of legal interpretation. And, are, uh, and, and precedent, I think, is foremost. There are these rules of statutory interpretation which can apply uh, appropriately adapted to constitutional instrument. Um, that, 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 that is ground, that, that they are methods um, which are, are legally authoritative, they have, their own, they have their own status in relation to the, the decisions that are being made, um, then they're not drawn from an, another universe. Um, I'm, I'm not suggesting that you know, the history can't be a background factor um, in reaching legal conclusions or that other disciplines can't be background, can't have sort of a, back, a background role, but it has to be recognized with philosophy or sociology or, or history, same thing, they're, they're being transformed and used actually for an improper purpose. There is just, I can see why cues of people wanting to talk. Know, so but maybe we should try, all of us try to be very succinct, and so uh, Will and then Barry and then 
then we'll get some response. What was the decision rule about the mics there? I was just curious. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the left always takes precedence. <laughs> <laughs> so I know this is a panel about constitutional law, but I have a question that would help me understand the sort of historical position about a different kind of law, property law. So in property law, frequently current ownership turns on past facts. There's a doctrine called nemo dot that often means you can't give what you don't have, and so to figure out who owns something, you have to look backwards and see who owned things as a legal matter at various times in the past. So my question is, when that happens, as it does in American courts, and you need to figure out who owned the Old Dominion Boat Club in 1789 or 1848 or Blackacre? Who owned something 150 years ago? Is that a question that historians can answer? Is that a question lawyers can answer? Is that a question nobody can answer? H how do we think about that kind of historical legal question? Barry, why don't you ask, and then we'll respond to both if we can. OK, well then, quickly. <laughs> I'm not sure who that's directed to. Well, I can I give a one-line answer, and then I'm happy for others to tell you that. But the answer is, sure, that's in the historical record. But the record of the past is not the same as history. So, so Historians so, may know where to look, but uh, that's not doing history to come up with the answer, looking through the, through, through the old property records to come up with with the answer, who who was the who, whose name was on the title back in you know whenever? So That's not doing history. Of of so it is in the Torrens title system in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Indefeasibility of title. <laughs> uh, so I have a question mostly for Helen, though I have to start by just asking Saul because I, I'm just curious. So the new originalism is that? Does anybody else take that to be ironic, or is it just me? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway, so Helen, I'm just curious about you know accepting your views about history and understanding that I'm not about to talk to, about originalism at all. Do you think that history can be used? You know, if the task of the judge, this is going to be controversial, but if the task of the judge was to figure out in interpreting the Constitution what's constitutive of us, can history play a role there in terms of understanding? who we are, because you sort of do this formal leap to law, and it seems to me that there's a role for history that isn't originalist history, it's just history, who we are. I don't really understand, in a sense, the distinction you're making be between history and originalist history when it's used, when history is used in the service of law. Um, who we are is not a question that judges can answer. Um, whether they use history or not, but they're much more likely to be, well, they can draw upon sociology, they can draw upon demographics, they can draw upon statistics, they can draw upon the history of the United States, um, and they can muse on the question, who are we in 2014? I, I don't think that's a legal, um, I don't think that's a legal question. I don't think judges are competent to ask that, to answer that question, who are we? And I, and I don't, Perhaps it's an Australian perspective. Um, I don't see how that answer would be necessary to um, de determine, to rule on, on decisions in real life disputes, um, which judges have to deal with. So I'm really interested in the role of structural arguments, uh, particularly uh, among originalists. So, and it's prompted by your, your observation quickly, Michael, that structural arguments like Marshall and McCulloch are a lot like textual arguments. And I think we, I want to pause over that because there are structural arguments that are like textual arguments. When you think about the structure of the text, the fact that the necessary and proper clause is in Article 1, Section 8, not Article 1, Section 9, or the fact that you have certain powers listed there and there's a logic that connects a lot of them together. But oftentimes there are different kinds of structural arguments that self-identified originals will invoke you would make inferences from the structures and relationships, the institution that the Constitution establishes. That's what does most of the work in McCulloch. There is a supremacy principle and a means ends principle. The ends implies reason. The case is over before he gets to any part of the text. And that's what you see when we talk about an anti-commandeering principle, when we talk about the fundamental principle of equal state sovereignty, when we talk about the modern, very robust doctrine of state sovereign immunity. So it seems to me that kind of structural reasoning, which many originalists embrace, is much further away from the text or architecture, the way Appeal uh, talks about it, and much further along towards purposes, consequences, your basic vision of what the national ethos is. After all, if Marshall doesn't think it's a good idea to march armies across the continent, then Maryland wins that case. <laughs>
<clears throat> well, I, I think I agree with essentially all of your observations here. I mean, I think that there are structural arguments that are more closely tied to text, and then there's structural, or so-called, I'm going to put scare quotes around it, structural arguments uh, that partake more of uh, uh, free-floating analogic reasoning. And it's, it's like any, of, any kind of textual argument and, uh, and textual structural argument, there will be sound reasoning and there will be some that will be less sound reasoning. Um, I've got a review of Akhil Amar's book coming out. You know, when it talk about analogical reasoning and structural principles, you know, Akhil is an old and dear friend, but in his most recent book on unwritten constitutionalism, he, he sort of takes this analogical method and really goes to incredible extremes with it. You know, there, there's, in any of these processes, any type of structural argument, the meaning of the words of the text has to operate as a constraint on what you can do with it. Structural arguments are better textual arguments to the extent that your structural argument comes from a provision in the text or a description of the relationship between other provisions of the text. There are other types of structural arguments, so-called ones, that I don't recognize as actually good, sound textual approach. And then there are some that are fairly debatable. There'll be a range of, of the fact that one employs an originalist textualist uh, methodology, including structural arguments, doesn't mean that there won't be some fair disputes as to how those apply in specific circumstances. Keith, do you think modern new originalist theory has anything to say about that question? Uh, I, I, I don't know whether it has anything to say about that question. I mean, my, my inclination is the same, though, thinking that, that I don't see a difficulty about structuralist arguments as such from an originalist perspective. I think they're perfectly reasonable as well as anything else. I'm not wedded to a clause-bound textualism and how I want to try to think about it. My concern about structural arguments in general is that they are often quite indeterminate. Um, and sometimes the structure, structural principles are coming from someplace else that is not very well connected to original meaning, right, broadly speaking, uh, at all. But my concern about McCulloch, I have many concerns about McCulloch Maryland, but among them um, is that I think that particular principle, while a perfectly reasonable principle, is not clear it's a determinate outcome from this, from a structure of federalism like the one we have embodied in, in that text and was adopted in that constitution. So why should Marshall get to pick it rather than somebody else getting to pick which, which particular structural principles we're going to adhere to? Bob? Um. In many ways, Professor Irving's solution to this dilemma that we have is very, very tempting. The, uh, but unfortunately, it's not available to Americans. <laughs> I knew that argument would arise. <laughs> it's not available to Americans because our materials of legal interpretation are rich in historical argument. We do not consider historical argument to be outside the province of lawyers and, and of law. Our political discourse, like our legal discourse, is saturated in historical argument, has been so since the founding. In that way, modern lawyers more closely resemble Edward Cook than they do a formalist judge. That's just not our legal tradition. The, uh, and uh, and, and uh, uh, the arguments at, for independence, at the founding, over constitutional structure, have always been argued. Now, the, the, the difficulty for legal argument that as legal argument is closely tied to historical argument is that there has grown up in the interim this entire profession of specialists called historians who have a completely different way of going about history, do, re, looking at history and reasoning about it. The, uh, the, our history, John Reed has, very, has a very nice uh, account in his work in, on revolutionary lawyers as, uh, uh, of the kind of history they use as forensic history. The Cook, in a sense, doesn't mean for people to take literally his assertions about what the Anglo-Saxon Constitution actually was. He's completely aware that he's modernizing the Anglo-Saxon Constitution, but these arguments are not traditionally unavoidable. As Keith Whittington says, for example, we appeal to the founders as authoritative lawgivers. That's one kind of historical argument we have. The authoritative lawgivers said this. We appeal to their authority and their example, or we say, our traditions are this. Or we say, there's been a narrative of progress from that horrible thing to this relatively good thing, and our decisions are following that narrative of progress. All of this, these, these background narratives and assertions about 
what the past was and how it relates to the present are so omnipresent in our, in our styles of legal argument, justification, and reasoning that I don't think the purification ritual that Professor Irving finds in Australia can be used in this country. Can I just like say that, that I, I'm, not, I'm not for a minute suggesting that um, the past record is never used or never, that, that it's improperly, or it's always improperly used in, in legal reasoning. So the, the, the record of the past is, is often relevant to legal reasoning. Um, and I'm certainly not suggesting that it, you know, the entire history of the US courts using reference to the past um, can, be, can be swept aside. Not at all. I think that uh, what has to be understood in the context of the originalism debate is that lawyers and judges are not doing history. They're using the past. If they're doing it properly, they're using it in the service of legal reasoning. That's different from what is, goes on, as I understand it, in the originalism debate, which is about what you can know about the past that history done by historians can actually throw a light on. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to give the impression that I'm saying that judges should only ever work from the present, or maybe you know, yesterday, as far back as the past uh, uh, is possible. Um, but I think there's no justification for um, in, in the way in which history outside the discipline of legal reasoning is used, I think there's no more just greater justification for using history than there is for using sociology, for example, um, as another discipline, or philosophy. Um, just because the past record is used in legal reasoning doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean that um, the use of history in the proper disciplinary sense has has a, a legitimate status that other forms, that other disciplines of understanding don't have either. So uh, to, just to, to summarize that, it's to say, sure, legal reasoning use the, uses the record of the past all the time, and that's fine. But to say that originalism has a legitimacy and authority because it is grounded in the use of history, I think the argument could easily, could just as well be said, well, let's, do, let's use what we learn from sociology uh, to enlighten legal reasoning. Um, it, it, it's no more of a justification than for originalism than, pardon? Yes, yes, that's right. So there's no, no more originalism grounded in a reference to the discipline of history is no more legitimate than living uh, constitutionalism, than living interpretation uh, with respect to, to the sort of, to, to, to the use that's made of non-disciplines that fall outside the discipline of law. That's all I said. It, it, it seems to me that it depends on what the question is, that sociology is relevant when we're interested in facts about you know, how, how things work. Economics is relevant sometimes, and even in constitutional interpretation when, when that matters. But uh, history is relevant for a different set of issues. The data is relevant, the data, but the explanation is a different form. Just one quick point about what Bob Borden is saying. In a way, we're still dealing with the problem of pre-modern, modern, but now post-modern. Because the problem is that history, as a modernist enterprise that was going to discern historical truth, has displaced the pre-modern forensic history that, we were, that everyone was comfortable with that Reed talks about. And now I think the problem is we know that these historical narratives are constructed. But it's very difficult for the law to accept that we're arguing about which is the best narrative for our Supreme Court. But that's what they're arguing about. So we are very close to the end, but still some patient people. So Parker? Uh, yes, uh, I, I was uh, uh, trained as a historian and had a PhD before I went to law school. I, I practice, I don't profess. Um, I was very refreshed, um, Professor Irving, by what you said about there being an epist epist epistemological difference. Uh, there is, because at the end of the histories, we rarely read so ordered um, as we do in at the end of a judicial opinion. But I wonder, and, and this c comes from being a practitioner, um, I've, I've gotten, I, I make historical arguments when I make arguments in court, and I make them in front of panels of judges, some who are better historians, some who are not better historians, and I get to judge that, of course, as, as the other <laughs> before them. Um, the, some of the best uh, uh, argument, his, historical arguments I've had is when when the judges themselves take on the, the mantle of historian and dig into the data 
And and I wonder, and, and this goes to Professor Cornell's point, or at least comment on uh, uh, Anders' subjectivity, um, because we are talking about law as a legal institution, whether or not history has a, has a role in, um, in talking about what constitutional meaning has when we're talking, when we're responding and, and precedent is responding um, to, uh, to, to prior decisions. And I'll give just one quick example. The argument I was, I was referring to was, in, uh, was a, a case involving Heller and its a, applicability to a, a, a restriction on domestic vi violent misdemeanors, holding handguns, which is a relatively new development. Um, and uh, uh, in the Heller dicta is, is, is a historical um, uh, uh, piece that gets a, a lot of, of, um, of, of, of treatment. Now, what we're arguing about usually in, in those cases that follow is whether or not the judges are being good historians or not. So my question I, is, is this. Is, is there a role for history, is you, not, not, not as a, in, in the judicial sense, should it, should it have any more legitimacy or not, but to inform the discourse of the weight of precedent and the way to, that we should accord precedent. And if we can say somebody is being a crappy historian, we, we chuck it out in favor of, 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 of somebody who is, who is doing histo history better. Because we agree on it, and we agree on it because there is a is is a certain consensus based on a, a, an empiricism that I think Professor Irving embraces um, that um, one should one should defer to to uh, agreement on a on a um, on a, a range of meanings that are acceptable that we would we would follow, and I'll just leave it at that. Well, I think the the question about the presumptive presumptively lawful part of Heller where apparently if an earlier legislature made a balancing decision in the past and, and, the, and the regulation has some history to it, it's presumptively lawful. Of course, the interesting question is how, how, when does history begin? When does history end? If it's 50 years old, does it have a historical foundation? Does it have to be 100 years old? Does it have to go all the way back to the founding era? What do you deal with the fact that during Reconstruction you had a different regulatory regime? I mean, Heller, I mean, Quite apart, whatever you think about the history in Heller, the, the guidelines for practicing lawyers, I mean, I haven't found many practicing lawyers who remarked that, God, Heller was just a model of clarity, and what a beautifully crafted decision, uh, you know, and I mean, I, I feel for you, because it's really not clear, like, how you would even do the history, like, what's the metric for presumptively lawful? My so this is a follow-up. So you said, so you divided up the world into clear cases and then sort of, I guess, unclear cases. And, um, and so the way I divide it up is there's sort of clear cases, there's close cases, and then there may be tie cases. And in the close cases, we go with the stronger evidence. Um, close, reasonable minds may differ, but you know my judgment is we go with the, the so your response to, Michael McConnell was, oh, well, we don't do that because there needs to be a contradiction between the Constitution and the statute. But that begs the question of what the meaning of the, con of the Constitution is. And we might determine the meaning of the Constitution is determined by the best evidence rather than the clear evidence. Yeah, that, uh, that's a great question and great, great insight. Um, you know, I said there will be, you know, that you need a hermeneutic rule for what you do with a sufficiently determinate text, and that there are different rules for what do you do when textual meaning runs out. Right? You could put you could put an, an, uh, a category in between. I mean, what is your methodology for determining when an issue is sufficiently determinate, or sufficiently, or, or or not sufficiently determinate that you can say that the Constitution applies a rule? Um, if I hear you right, basically you're saying that there are going to be some hard cases in terms of where that line is as to when an answer is sufficiently clear that a court can uh, apply it as law. But you know, I, I think that's an unexceptionable point. It's not probably a point of disagreement. 
uh, originalism as a methodology and a default rule that if there is no answer, you go with what the, you can't invalidate what was done, we'll have some hard cases as to what falls within that interpretive principle too. I think your question also points to the fact that there's going to be, that you can have different kinds of standards of deference that you might want to adopt, and that's really, I think, separate from a theory of originalism. Right? You need a theory of constitutional adjudication to tell you how deferential should you be when the, when the evidence is uncertain. So when you say, as a judge, I would say, well, this seems most reasonable to me, my inclination is to think you need a higher standard and it seems reasonable to the judge before you overturn the decisions of the legislature. But you need a theory, and it's not originalist theory, it's a different theory, to tell you where that bar should be set. Yeah, but you can go. <laughs> Stephen. This is just a, a follow-up to that question in some sense um, for, for um, Michael and Keith. If it were determined that the founders were intentionalists and whatever one, whatever kind of knowledge one has to be know to be able to make statements like the founders were, um, what would that mean for original public meaning original? That's a great question. If the founders were intentionalist, okay, now... <laughs> Let me, can I, can I modify your hypothetical? Okay. If they wrote into the text, <laughs> interpret this according to our subjective intentions and expectations, right? right? Then we, but, but otherwise, you know, you're, you're saying, if we could discern their interpretive intention by means extrinsic to the text, would we follow that rather than the text? You, you, but, you but see let, me, the let me back up. If okay. the prevailing legal doctrine concerning the Con the interpretation and application of legal documents at the time of the founding were what one is searching for here is not the original public meaning, but rather the original intentions of the author summed in the following way. But that doesn't that that is written about in treatises. Let's imagine, but is not in recorded in this particular instrument. What do you think? Oh, that's great. Background understandings, right? You know, what is the backdrop? You know, uh, Steve Sachs is like the master of this. You know, what are the backdrop understandings? that get imported into your constitutional interpretation that is part of sort of the, the nature of the meaning of the words. Um, and let me answer this, and, and this partly responds to something Helen said too. Um, you know, I think that there is a relevance of intention of the lawgiver in terms of understanding the meaning of law, right? With a constitution, and this is not exactly the problem of discerning collective intention, but it's sort of it. It's like, who is the lawgiver when you talk about the Constitution? You know, the early versions of originalism said, well, it's the framers, it's the founders of Philadelphia. And then successive versions said, well, no, it's actually the ratifier's understanding. I think that the lawgiver here, you can actually say, it is kind of a fictitious legal construct, the lawgiver that the Constitution declares in the text is. We the people. Well, who is this we the people guy, right? But some sort of amalgam of the intentions or designs of the framers, the understandings of the ratifiers, as embodied in an authoritative legal text. It's a species of intentionalism, but I think it's more of refinement that focuses on, you know, given that you do have a collective and given that you can't, you wouldn't want to equate the meaning of the Constitution with anybody's specific intentions. You go with the the objective meaning as best you can do it, but it's not well, inconsistent with that. We have already gone over, for <laughs> which I don't know whether to apologize or suggest that maybe everyone would want to pay a little bit extra uh, ticket price <laughs> uh, uh, for the benefit. But maybe if Nathan and I'm sorry, I don't know your name, could speak very quickly, uh, that'll be you'll have the final word without him. Uh, lawyers talk about legal judgment as though it were something that existed. And assuming it's absolutely culturally and socially conditioned at any given time, this is mostly, I guess, for Saul, but it might be that <clears throat> lawyers and legal scholars who are doing the history uh, to determine meaning of a legal text um, have to exercise an intellectual virtue that is kind of peculiar to legal practitioners um, and that it might even be difficult for people who don't have that virtue to recognize whether it's being done well or not. That's it. Um, 
Let's I don't hear, think so. Let's hear the last uh, yeah, comment, and then so. you do not, or you do. Well, I, I mean, it, it seems. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I think that's very convenient uh, because that sort of, you know, that's a get out of jail card, uh, right? That you're not held to accountable to reasonable historical standards for making a historical claim. I do realize that there there are differences. Like, for instance, when I write as an, um, you know, in an amicus brief and participate in one, I'm engaging with a different voice, and there are different rules. Uh, and when you write, when you do scholarship, there are different rules as well. But I just, I, I think that if, if, if originalism is going to make claims about truth, they have to be true. Uh, and I agree, notwithstanding anything I might say about the problems of using history, if you're, going to, if you're going to do it, at least do it properly. Do it right. And say why you, why you, and how are you doing it. it? Isn't originalism, in a sense, just a nomenclature for one's philosophy? It could have easily been judicial activism. You could have put a different label on it. Conservatism, liberalism, I mean, it's just some, some judicial judge's interpretation of a document which, you know, so they gave it the name originalism. It becomes, you know, we, it just happens to be the nomenclature we're using now. 20 years from now, it may or may not be something that, uh, uh, you know, is in vogue. I mean, the, the judges have looked at history at all points in time, and they've looked back, that's stare decisis. So aren't you? Aren't you, in to a certain degree, emphasizing someone's philosophy, and they have five or six votes versus the others, and so therefore they're more dominant now than, than they might have been in the past or in the future? Well, I, I think that the theory behind originalism, as the theory behind following precedent, is to try to find a basis for judging which isn't the, the philosophy of the judge. Now, whether that works or not is the much the subject of the panel. But I would like to uh, please join me in thanking Mr. <laughs>